I'm sorry if you're a first-time guest. You had to go through that. <laughs> Usually, sometimes it's even worse than that, though. I, but anyway, glad you're here this morning. Uh, if you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up to Ephesians chapter 4. And we're in the middle of our sermon series, Grace in Action, where we're talking about uh, this book of Ephesians. That's actually a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Ephesus. He wrote it about 60 to 60. 3 AD, so about 30 years after Jesus rose from the dead. And he wrote it to a church that he knew very well because he'd actually founded this church and preached the gospel to them for the first time 11 years earlier. And then he came back a couple of years later and actually served as the pastor of that church for about three years. So he's writing to some people that he knows very well. The city of Ephesus was a very advanced city for the time. It was a huge metropolis in that day, second probably only to the city of Rome for comfort and convenience. It was also a trading hub for the Roman Empire, and so there were lots of different types of people, people of different races and cultures and economic status and all different kind of people, and so it was very diverse. Ephesians was also a place where sexual immorality was normalized. It was celebrated. It was even politicized. The patron goddess of Ephesus, the Roman goddess Artemis, was the goddess of the hunt and fertility. And so they would celebrate that in their worship. So there would have been male and female prostitutes in the temple. uh, And during their religious festivals, there would have been cultic prostitution and sexual immorality and all kinds of eroticism. And so Paul is writing this letter to this church to encourage them. And, And the first three chapters or the first half of this letter is really all about what God has done for us. And if you've been here for three weeks, you've seen that, who our identity is in Christ. And because we are in Christ, we are forgiven, we are set free, we are part of God's holy people and his family. And then in the second half that we begin today, he is gonna begin to talk about how do we live out of that identity. And and if you just showed up for the first time during this series today, it's going to almost feel like chapter four is a a different whole book or a different letter. But you've got to understand the context of chapter four. He's been talking for three chapters of the first half, talking about who we are. And, And then today, he's going to begin to talk about how do we live out of that identity. And I think when we hear sermons about, you know, the way we're supposed to live, we get a little confused about what, how Christianity works. We, we start to think that Christianity is, is about what we do for God through our obedience, but Christianity is actually built on what God did for us. And, and so if you're here for the first time during this series, you need to understand the context of how we live flows out of who we are. So with that understanding, let's look at Ephesians 4.1. Paul says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. So Paul starts by saying he's a prisoner. And to understand this, you need to know that at the time he wrote this letter, Paul was actually a prisoner in the city of Rome. He was held by the Roman Empire for preaching and teaching about Jesus. But notice, he doesn't say that he is a prisoner of the Roman Empire. He says he's a prisoner of the Lord. In in other words, how he lives naturally flows out of who he is. And so for the first time in 4 verse 1, Paul is actually telling us to do something. For three straight chapters, he hadn't told us to do anything. He's telling us who we are. And and then in 4.1, he tells us for the first time, how do we respond to that? But notice he's not giving us specific conduct here. This is the challenge for the remaining passages in the last three weeks. He is going to describe for us what it looks like to live a life that's worthy of of your calling. And he's going to get into more specifics about that. Now, 4.1 4.1 in the NIV uses the word then. And, and I don't think that does a great job of showing us the transition or the cause and effect transition that Paul is making here from the first three chapters into the fourth chapter. I think if you look at some of the other English translations, you can see that better. And so I want to look at the NASB. And if you look, it says, therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. You see this word, therefore. Therefore is telling you a cause and effect relationship. Anytime you see the word therefore in the Bible, you need to ask yourself what the word therefore is there for. 
I know that's a goofy little saying, but it actually does help you understand what you're reading because when you see this word, therefore, it's telling you that there's a cause and effect relationship. In other words, everything you've read before is because and what you read after is the fact. And so what Paul is telling us here is because of all that God has done for you, because he has loved you so much, because you are now in Christ, you've been changed and transformed, therefore you live a life that brings him honor and glory. And and here's why understanding this is so important. Christianity is not a religion of rules. They surprise some of you. Christianity is really not about rules at all. It's about relationship. And, And so many of us think that somehow we are trying to earn God's favor through the way we act, but it's just the opposite of what we think. Because of the grace we've received for Jesus, from Jesus, because of the things he has done, for the love he has for us, because of that, we try to live more like him. Here's another way to say this. We don't obey to be accepted by God. We obey because we're accepted by God. You see that huge difference? I think we get really confused about the gospel and Christianity, and we mess up the cause and effect. Here's where we get messed up. We think that the cause is obedience, and the effect is acceptance. That's not the gospel at all. Here's the true gospel. The true gospel is the cause is acceptance and the effect is obedience. Because of what Jesus did for us, because he loves us and accepts us, we obey. And and that's what Paul is setting up through his first three chapters. And now he's going to transition to tell us how to live a life worthy of our calling. Look at verse 2. He says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. So he's telling us some things here that we need to do to live with one another. And he's telling us these things that we need to be humble and gentle and patient. And then he tells us something that is a little different, bearing with one another in love. It's not as crystal clear based on the wording. Another word that can be used here is long-suffering. And I love the word long-suffering because it kind of defines itself in the word, right? You suffer longer than you think you should have to. Gives you this idea that we have to put up with one another's little quirks. And we have to put up with the little differences we have. And we have to forgive and move on when we are offended. The reason Paul is telling us these things is because he knows that conflict in the church is inevitable. I'm going to say that again because some of you are going to be surprised by that. Conflict in the church is inevitable. It's going to happen. You know, some people are so surprised when they get in some disagreement with another church member and they're just like wowed out by that. And they're like, oh, Jesus, protect me from this conflict. I just can't believe people act this way. And I I just want to go, look, it's a family. Look at your crazy family. You'll know, right? We're a family. And that's how that works. I've seen people leave the church because they had a minor disagreement with some other church member and they didn't feel like they could be in the same church with them. Two weeks ago, Paul talked to us about how we are all unified, that we are all one family, one group, because we share the common trait of being in Christ. But remember, he's telling us that this church family is very different. We're made up of men and women, people with different racial backgrounds and nationalities. We're made up of people with different ideas about politics. We're different economic status. We're all one family because we're all in Christ. But families occasionally disagree. That's just how it works. And so family fights shouldn't surprise us. Just look at your crazy family. I look at my crazy family, right? If you've been to a family reunion or a big Thanksgiving gathering or a Christmas gathering, family gatherings can be awesome, uplifting, relaxing, encouraging, life-giving, frustrating, discouraging, anger-provoking, and life-stealing all on the same day. I remember a very special Christmas Eve at my parents' house. This has been about 30 years ago, and it's funny today, but it was, it was not funny then. I'm just going to let you have a little peek into my crazy family. I had a special responsibility as the oldest child at Christmas time. I was the Christmas accountant. That was actually an official title that I had. It didn't pay very well, though. But my responsibility was to organize the presents, make sure everything went smoothly in the present opening on Christmas morning. And so the way we did that is... On Christmas Eve, we would move all the presents from under the tree in one room in my parents' house into the living room and set them in piles based on whose present it was. 
And so my parents' piles would go right by their favorite chairs so they could sit in their chairs Christmas morning. And some of the older, older kids with our spouses, we could sit on the couch and we had our piles there. The younger kids and some of the other people, they had little pallets on the floor, little blankets we put down and their piles were put there. And then my job was to make sure as we went around the room opening presents that in the last round, everybody had exactly one present to open. So sometimes I might make you open more than one present or I might skip you on a particular round so that on that last round, everybody had one present. So one year, my, one of my sisters, she'd just gotten married and her husband was celebrating Christmas with us for the first time. And she decided it was time for her to upgrade her position from the floor up on the couch. And so she wanted to bump some other people off to move to the couch. I was using the constitutional powers bequeathed to me as the Christmas accountant, and I denied her request. I vetoed it. And then rather than abiding by the law of the land, she, she went into open revolt. And so as we would bring presents from one room and put them in the piles, she would angrily run and grab the presents and run and put them back under the Christmas tree in the other room. This went on for like 15 or 20 minutes, and there was a dramatic conflict. And then a negotiated resolution of that, and we moved on. In my extended family, things can get crazy sometimes. But, you know, even in my immediate family, with just four kids and now with a, a son-in-law, when we all get together, family moments can go very quickly from making memories to making big old messes. And when we get together for several days, someone, usually not always, but usually me, will say this loving, uplifting phrase, family time is overrated. The reality is families are complex and sometimes they have disagreement. And the bigger families get, the more likely you are to have those disagreements and conflict. And so we need to understand how to relate to one another, how to deal with one another in those conflicts. Families have disagreements, sometimes families have fights, and we are a family. Now, it's great that we're a family, but we don't want to be a dysfunctional family. And so Paul says some things that we need to do to try to work through our dis disagreements and differences. He says that we should be humble and gentle and patient and long-suffering. And, and so he's given us these things that we need to, to, to live out with one another, these characteristics or these traits. These things are challenges in our own family, and they're challenges at church. So... Remember last week, we talked about this incredible power we have from the Holy Spirit to be transformed. This is where it comes into play. Because you can't just decide to be patient or humble or long-suffering. That's not just a decision you can make. But you have the power through the Holy Spirit to be transformed. And so you can pray to God that he would help you be more patient, more long-suffering, more humble, more merciful, these different things. Now, the other thing you can do is live out these things in little moments. You, you can't just make a decision to be patient, but you can make decisions in a particular moment to show patience or mercy or long-suffering. And, and over time, you'll start to be more patient or long-suffering. Uh, you'll see that over time. Like if I decide that I want to be skinny, I can't just decide to be skinny and get skinny. But what I can do is make little decisions at a meal that I'm going to eat less food, I'm going to eat healthier, I'm going to take in less calories than I burn. And over time, if I keep making that little decision at meal after meal after meal, eventually I'm going to become more skinny. Does that make sense? That's how it works with some of these traits. You decide in the moment to show those things, and then over time you get to be more humble or patient or gentle or long-suffering. And so that's very important because as a church family, we will have conflict. We, we may get our feelings hurt or be offended. And, and at some point, we need to learn how to deal with that and to grow in that and be more patient and loving with one another. Then Paul tells us, first, how do we relate to one another? And we just went through that. But then in the next couple of verses, in verses 3 through 6, he's going to tell us why this is so important. Look what, what he says. He says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So, Paul is telling us that we have to work hard 
to keep the unity of the Spirit. We have to be unified. But notice he doesn't tell us that we have to create unity. That's already been done for us. Jesus created unity in the church when he died for us and rose from the dead. And because of that, we have one faith, one hope, one baptism, one God. That is what unifies us. And then we just have to not mess that up. But that's actually more challenging than you might think. We have to work at that. Something else he says is that we are unified in the spirit. And I think that in the spirit is so important because you need to understand we are not organized and unified by a single church structure or a single denominational organization. We're not even unified by a common set of doctrine on secondary issues. We are unified because we all believe that Jesus did what he says he did and that he is who he claims to be. That's what unifies us. And so we can live in unity even with other churches that may disagree with us on secondary issues that we feel pretty strongly about because we are unified with them because we are all in Christ. And that's the kind of church that we want to be here at Kara City. We, we want to be for other churches, even if they don't agree with us on some issues that we think are very important. We're unified with them because they're sharing the gospel. They're sharing the good news of Jesus. That's who we want to be. I, I think so often when we hear that somebody's going to a different church, we, we react pretty poorly sometimes. And, and we may give that other church kind of a backhanded compliment. Like, it, it's a great church if you don't need deep preaching. It's a great church if you like old style music. It's a great church if you don't need a church that really tackles the tough issues. Or you, if you like feel good preaching, man, you go there. But that's not how we should be. We need to be for other churches. Look, we need to invite people to our church and we need to be thrilled when they become part of our church. But we also need to be happy when someone finds community in another place. Because we are all one in the spirit. We are unified by that. All right, look at the next section. This is Ephesians 4, 7 through 16. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Until we all, so Christ himself gave the apostles the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body is joined and held together by every supporting ligament. It grows and builds itself up in love as each part does, it, does its work. So Paul starts this little section by reminding us what Jesus did, that he descended from heaven, that he died on the cross, he was buried in the ground, he rose on the third day, and then he ascended back to heaven. But he tells us that as Jesus ascended back to heaven, that he gave us some offices of the church to lead his church, to lead the early church and to still lead the church today. And so Paul talks about five offices of leadership in the early church. Look, look back at verse 11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. And I want to actually work backwards with this and start at the end and kind of work our way back. And so we'll start with pastors and teachers. Jesus gave us the pastors and teachers, and that is the most common office in the church, in the modern church, are the pastors and teachers. Now, some theologians believe that this is actually just one office, and the way the, the Greek was written here by Paul tells us that pastor and teacher is actually a single office held by a single individual. Some other theologians disagree with that, and they would say that there are two different offices that can either be filled by two different peoples, one can preach, one can pastor, or it can be filled by a single individual. But whether it's one office or two, it's very clear here, these roles or this role that was given to the church. Notice here, it doesn't say you decide to become a teacher or a pastor. It says Christ gave us those roles. In other words, you can't just decide to be a, a preacher or a teacher or a pastor. You are called to that role. And that's very important to understand. And 
so there's another role that he gave is the evangelist. And the evangelist is also a role that still exists in the church today. This is somebody that is so dynamic and so gifted by God to teach the gospel that they don't just teach and pastor a particular church, but instead they share the gospel with different groups of people. The, I think one of the great examples of this is Billy Graham. Man, he was a dynamic evangelist. I've read that 2.2 million people decided to follow Jesus at Billy Graham Crusades. He's an evangelist, and that's an important role for the church as well. But then look at the first two offices that Paul describes here. He says the apostles and the prophets. Now, I don't believe that apostles and prophets still exist in the church today. I believe that they were given by God to the early church because they needed the church to grow and expand quickly, and we also needed the, the New Testament. So he wanted to inspire people to write the New Testament. But I don't believe they still exist today. A lot of scholars agree with me in that, but there are some really smart people that love Jesus that believe that apostles uh, and prophets still exist today. But So let's start with the apostles. The apostles comes from the Greek word apostolos. And actually, that Greek word, you can't even translate it into English. It, it doesn't have a, an English equivalent. So when they made up or when they translated the Bible into English, they did something called a transliteration. They made up an English word that sounds like the Greek, Greek word. So apostolos became apostles. And if you were trying to define this term, here's how you would probably do it. A special emissary or a special ambassador from God. And, and so those first 12 men that followed Jesus, they were apostles. The replacement for Judas Iscariot after he betrayed Jesus became part of that apostle group. Paul became part of that apostle group. They were given dynamic power to do miracles through the power of Jesus. They spread the gospel quickly throughout the Roman Empire so that the gospel would ultimately get to Katy, Texas. I, I don't believe that we still have apostles today. But here's what I know for sure. We don't have apostles that have the authority of those original apostles. They were unique in church history and they were necessary at the time. I also believe that the role of prophet no longer exists in the church today. There were individuals in the early church that were given the very words of God so that they could write the New Testament so that we had that. They were given the words to expand God's word from the Old Testament, include new teaching in the New Testament. And I believe that that's what the prophets did. A lot of, some people would say that we still have prophets today. I, I don't believe that we do. But here's what I can say for certain. We don't have prophets today that have the authority to add to or change or take away the Bible. That's done. We, the Bible is complete. We don't have the authority to add to that. There are guys, there are preachers who have very amazing ways of illustrating and teaching God's truth. And that's a gift from God. But we are not authorized to change, take away, or add to God's word. So if you hear a preacher or a teacher say he's got some new revelation from God, run fast, run far, because that doesn't exist today. Now, those people that would say we still have prophets today, some of those just would define prophet a little different than I do. But what I can say for certain is that we don't have prophets who can add to or take away from the Bible. The Bible is complete. All right. But more important than what these roles are is what they were given to the church for. What is their purpose? Look, look at the next section. This is verses 12 and 13. It says that these roles were given to the church to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. He's saying these church offices were given to equip God's people, that, that's you, for works of ministry. I'm going to say something that's going to surprise some of you a little bit. My primary responsibility as your preacher is not to share the gospel with unbelievers. It's not my primary role. My primary role is not to convince non-believers to become believers. My primary responsibility is to equip you for ministry. The Bible is very clear that it's my job to equip you, and it's actually your job to carry out ministry. You have ministry actually more than I do. And my job is to prepare you for that. In college, I worked as 
at a summer camp for a couple of years as a camp counselor. And it was awesome because, like, I got to hang out with kids and swim in the pool, play games. I got paid to do that. And so it was great. I did that for a couple of years. And then the owner of the camp called me up and he said, maybe next summer would you like to be a camp director and actually help lead the camp? And I thought, wow, that's going to be awesome. That, it's got to even be better than being a, a camp counselor. What I found the next summer, though, is it was very different that I was no longer the primary contact. I was no longer swimming in the pool and playing games and hanging out. Instead, my job became to prepare the counselors and to equip the counselors to show the kids a good time. So I needed to make sure that they were trained, that they had the right equipment and the right schedule so that they could do those things. And eventually, I came to love being a camp director. But it took a little transition for me because I was no longer the primary contact with the campers. There's a lot of truth about how that works in the church. You are the primary contact with the world around us. My job is to prepare you to live that out and to share ministry. The New Testament churches in the first century, they were all very small. And really, pretty much everybody that went to church, they were already Christians. And so they would come to church, they would pray together, they would sing, they would be trained and prepared so that they could live holy lives so that they could go out and share ministry, so that they could share their faith. And then more people would decide to follow Jesus. They'd come to church. They'd be equipped and trained and prepared to do ministry, and so on and so forth. And modern church services, we've taken on a lot more of an evangelical role, not because that's the best way, but we've done it out of necessity. Because modern Christians aren't nearly as good, typically, at sharing their faith as those first century Christians were. And so we've had to become more evangelistic in our worship services. But, but think how much less efficient that is. There's one of me. We've got a couple of other pastors. There's a lot of you. If you are out, you are sharing ministry. If you're sharing your faith, we're going to impact the community around us in a way bigger way than if it's just the pastors doing it. Let me give you an example of that. We've got a suppers and showers event coming up this Tuesday. We've got another one the following Tuesday. We actually decided to go from one a month to two a month because we had so many people participating. Well, suddenly it's summer and everybody's like, eh, I don't know, maybe I'll let somebody else do it. And, and now we need spots. We are serving the least of these. These are the homeless people in our community. That is your responsibility, that you have ministry. And, and so that's your primary job. And my job is to prepare you and equip you for that. Here's something else that's primarily your responsibility that sometimes gets a little confused. It is primarily your responsibility to take care of one another. Again, there's one of me and there's a bunch of you. And if we commit to take care of one another the way the Bible says we're supposed to, we're going to be amazed at what God does in our church because we're going to love each other and serve one another and be a dynamic place that people want to be a part of. It's also my job as the pastor to teach you God's word and to prepare you to understand the truth of God's word. Paul says so that you can be mature eventually and you're not tossed around by false teaching. What he's saying is there was a lot of false teaching then and there's still a lot of false teaching today, a lot of false gospel running around. And it's my job to teach you, but it's your job to learn to read scripture yourself so you can know the difference between the true gospel and false gospel when you hear it. So you're spiritually mature to separate truth from lies. All right, then Paul changes gears a little bit in verses 17 through 24. He says, so I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every impurity and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you've learned when you heard about Christ and you were taught about him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So Paul starts out and says, don't live like the Gentiles do which was kind of an odd statement given that he was writing to a church that was mostly Gentiles or non-Christians. And, and so it kind of sounds like he's saying, don't live like who you are. But that's not what he's saying at all. He's saying, don't live like who you were. 
See, these Christians in Ephesus, they would have been part of that culture in Ephesus of sexual immorality before Paul came and taught them about God and and shared the gospel. But that's not who they are now. They are transformed. They're changed. They're new. And so he's saying, don't live like who you were. Live like who you are. Their identity has changed. Yeah, I think there's a tendency for Christians and even churches to try to convince the world around us that we're not as weird as they think they are and that we aren't as different from them as they think we are. Boy, that's a mess. That's a mistake. First of all, we can't do that. The more we live like the world, the more they're going to criticize us for not being true to what the Bible says and the more they're not going to respect us. But more than that, we can't do that because that's not who we are. That's not our identity. We've been changed and transformed. See, we're to go out and love the people in the world just like they are, with all their brokenness and sin. We're to engage with them. We're to serve them. But we can't be changed to live like them. You see the difference? See, Jesus was constantly hanging out with sinners. He hung out and had dinner with them. He would travel with them on occasion. And he loved being with sinners. Sinners loved hanging around Jesus. But Jesus was never changed by that. He never began to live like they do. That's the example for us. We are called to be in the world, but not of the world. And so that's why it's so important as Christians that we come to church services on Sunday morning, that we get involved in Bible studies, that we get involved in community groups and small groups with each other so that we can encourage one another and prepare each other, so that we can go out and share ministry. We can go out and share the gospel, but we're not changed by the world around us. Instead, we're changed by Jesus. See, I think part of the problem for us as churches is we've lost the identity of what church is. So many non-Christians, and and probably some of you as well, think that church is a place you go to. Or or church is a time on Sunday mornings where you go and sing some songs and pray. That's not church. Church. You don't identify with being part of a movement that Jesus started to transform the world. That's what church is. Church is in the building. Church is in the time that we meet. Church is us. And we are called to leave this place to go out into the world and to transform the world through the power of Jesus because we love people differently, because we serve people differently, but not because we live like they do. And that's why it's so important that we understand what it's like to be built up to have ministry. All right, look at the last part of Ephesians 4. This is verses 25 through 32. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building one another up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. So at the very end of this section, Paul is getting really specific about how we live. And he's starting to give us some very specific examples of what we're supposed to do. And he says we're supposed to be honest. not supposed to lie to the world around us, but but we can't lie to one another. And here's what he's saying. When you lie to other members of the church, you're actually lying to yourself. Because he says we're all one body. Think about it this way. If your hand reaches out and touches something really hot but your hand tells your brain that it's not hot, it's going to stay there, and your whole body gets burned. That's what it's like when we lie to one another. We're lying to ourselves, and so he's telling us we have to be honest with one another. We do that in love. Look, it's way better for us to honestly talk about our disagreements and things that are upsetting us rather than to allow bitterness and hurt to build up until it explodes, and we then react where we, we can't be in the same room with one another. We have to be honest about that. And we have to do that in love. You know, I actually have four different team values for our pastoral team. And, um, you know, I, I, do, I say them every week in staff meeting. So they hopefully have them by heart. I actually quiz them 
When church is over, make sure they know all four of those. You can run it by any of them. But one of them is, I say, I want us to be a team that's honest with one another. Because we want to be a team that encourages and compliments, but we also want to be a team that's honest about things that we want to see different or want to do different and things that bother us. Because real, honest relationship is built in real, honest communication in love. We can't be afraid to have conversation about things that are problems. But Paul gives us how we do that with gentleness and patience and humility. Real relationships are built on honest communication shared in love. See, the words we use are so powerful. We've got to understand that. Words bring life and death. They bring healing and hurt. You get to pick which one they do, and they will do either one you choose. Look at how the Old Testament says this in the book of Proverbs. This is 1821. It says, the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. That's awesome. You don't really understand what it's saying exactly. So let's look at how the message paraphrase, paraphrases that. It says, words kill, words give life. They're either poison or fruit. You choose. That's true. That's just a little part of what the Bible has to say about the words we use. Words are powerful, and they can be used to encourage and build up or to tear down and destroy. And this is why it's so important that you think carefully about the words you say. Because one wrong word or comment can tear down a relationship that you've been working weeks or months or years to build. One post on social media that's uh, racially insensitive or that's inappropriate can tear down a relationship you've been working on. And so then when you want to share with your faith with someone, or you just want to give them some encouragement and some instruction, they're not listening to you. They don't hear what you're saying now because they still remember what you said before. One careless word can hurt everything you've been working to do. Get control of your tongue so that we can speak life into one another. And Paul's saying that. Then in verse 26 and 27, Paul says not to sin in your anger. And then he says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. But that's not enough. He comes back a few verses later in verse 31 and he says, don't get rid of all anger and brawling and slander. And what he's saying here is that we've got to be real careful with anger, that we have a tendency to sin in our anger. And I'm starting to become more and more convinced that righteous anger really isn't a good thing for us. God can have righteous anger because he is perfect and he can do that with perfection. But so often when we think we're righteously angry or righteously indignant, we, we don't treat people the way we're called to treat people. And it causes us to tear down and destroy, not build up and improve. See, here's the thing. We can be angry at sin, but we better make sure we treat sinners the way Jesus did, with mercy and love, loving them right where they are and showing them grace. See, then we can have the right attitude and the right perspective to share God's perfect truth. We share it in love, not righteousness, or self-righteousness or moral pride. If you want to be angry at sin, start right here. Start with the sin in your own life. You cannot have an authentic Christian faith when you're out accusing the world around you of sin and ignoring the sin in your own heart. You just can't do it. So here's the thing. If we want to talk about marriage, and we want to talk about the sanctity of marriage between one man and one woman, then we better make sure our marriages are sanctified. Our marriages are holy. They're, they're not torn down by unfaithfulness or pornography or not treating each other like Jesus. We should talk about those things, but we better make sure that we live up to it before we start talking about it. If we want to talk about the sanctity of life for the unborn, and we should, and we better make sure we're sanctifying and honoring life. We better be passionate about things like adoption, supporting unwed mothers, the foster care system. We need to be passionate about serving the homeless in our community and make sure that we are sanctifying and making holy life from start to finish because that's what we're called to. Make sure that we're living out what we say. It all comes down to living a life that's worthy of your calling. You are in Christ you are God's holy people. You are different. That's your identity. And then how we live flows out of that. 
So how do we do that? You know, I've been married to my wife for about 34 years at this point. And as the husband, it is my responsibility to make all the big decisions. So the big decisions in our family are my responsibility and, and my responsibility alone. We haven't had one of those yet, 34 years, but my wife assures me that when we have one, I get to make it. So I'm really excited about that when it happens. <laughs> That's kind of how we live out our Christian faith. It's not one big decision. It's a thousand little decisions in the course of every day, deciding to show these traits that we're called to. So it's deciding to show patience when your child asks the same question, feels like for the millionth time. It's deciding to be honest with a church member, even when a little white lie feels like it'd be the easier way out. It's about using your words to build up and encourage, not tear down and gossip. It's about not getting angry when you feel like you were slighted in some way or somebody said something in community group that you didn't like. It's all these little things that we live out. It's a daily commitment to look more and more like Jesus through the power we've been given in the Holy Spirit. So as we wrap up today, I want to leave you with this question. I want you to think seriously about it. Are you living a life that's worthy of your calling? Let's pray.